Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Knut Blind, and I have the pleasure together with my colleagues Mirko Bim, Andrew Katz and Sasha Komuto to present you the uh, findings of our study on the open source impact at the EU, which has been commissioned by the U European Commission uh, in 2019. And we have just uh, released the report at the beginning of September uh, this year. Uh, the Fraunhofer Institute uh, is, uh, ISI is, is one of, of several institutes within the Fraunhofer societies. And um, we especially work on innovation research uh, and provide uh, policy advice, uh, but also uh, we are also consulting companies. Okay, thank you, Knut. Just uh, a few words about Open Forum Europe. Um, we are a not-for-profit independent think tank based in Brussels. Uh, we work at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. Uh, we were originally founded in the UK in 2002 uh, with a mission to promote an open and competitive ICT market, uh, including a level playing field for open source. Now we cover a range of digital topics, um, but we are always working with a range of stakeholders uh, with academia and, and communities in order to provide policy advice um, to the European institutions. Um, hand back over to Knut. Yeah, policymakers need evidence. Uh, Evidence-based policy, that's, that's the, the, the gold standard and, and the, the current need uh, in order then to make good uh, yeah, decisions uh, on the behalf of society. Um, regarding uh, open source, there has been some evidence. Um, in 2019 in Germany, uh, Bitkom launched the open source monitor, and I was also one of the kind of founders or initiators of this um, uh, um, activity. In parallel, there have been some uh, activities in France uh, and also Frank Nadel in the US uh, did some uh, work here uh, on, in this context. And already back in 2006, uh, there was a first study on, on the impact of open source, uh, also launched by uh, the European Commission. However, 15 years ago, uh, we see some significant changes. Uh, uh, the, uh, the report is available uh, uh, on this link, um, and also a brief summary, uh, including also a summary in, in French. Now, about the study, um, we applied a multi-method uh, approach uh, where kind of one big uh, kind of yeah, task was, was the analysis of the economic impact, which I'm going to talk about. Then uh, we have um, two tasks about the, the policy analysis about activities both within the EU, but also worldwide. Um, and uh, the economic analysis is then accompanied by, by some case studies. And all these different uh, sources and approaches are then going into the uh, uh, yeah, uh, derivation of uh, policy recommendations, uh, especially how open source can be really supported uh, in the future, um, also in the context of different other policy objectives. Now about the, uh, the economic impact, um, and uh, since we are relying our analysis on uh, historical data, um, the, the figures I'm going to present are referring to the situation in 2018. That means uh, with the UK uh, being member of the EU, um, <clears throat> but uh, this is certainly not a, a big limitation. Well, we looked uh, on the one hand at the investments and uh, into open source, and we find that um, around yeah, almost 10% of the 300, uh, the 3 million employees in computer bringing, uh, programming contribute to GitHub. Um, and uh, there's an effort of 60,000 uh, uh, full time equivalents. Uh, and if you transfer that into um, their yeah, cost, uh, we have uh, an investment of a one, one billion. And uh, an important uh, observation here is that especially small companies uh, make the, the most contributions. Um, and uh, therefore we also see that, that the smaller the company, the more uh, commits they are providing 
uh, in, in relative terms in this sense also. And um, we then kind of feed in these, these investments in a, a macroeconomic uh, uh, production function, uh, which allows us then to uh, attribute uh, the contribution to the European uh, GDP to the contributions to open source. And depending on the approach, we also looked on the one hand on uh, the number of comments, on the other hand, on the number of uh, contributors uh, based on, on the different GitHub accounts. And therefore, we get a range of uh, uh, contributions of open source to, to the European economy in 2018 between 65 and 95 billion. That means in the future, we can expect uh, probably after the COVID-19 crisis, a contribution uh, beyond 100 million per year. And this is a, an estimation on, on the lower bound because uh, there are other kind of yeah, unobservable um, um, effects which we, we are difficult to grasp with our uh, econometric approach. Um, if we put this uh, value in, into account, it's, it's the, 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 the economic contribution of the air and red water transport sector in the EU or somebody else uh, in the reaction to the world ports, that's, that's the the uh, um, GDP of uh, Luxembourg, therefore yeah, a significant amount. Um, and uh, what uh, does it say? That means if we, we, we really increase the number of contributors or the, the number of comments, we, we get to these uh, almost 100 billion increase in GDP. And, and, and in order to keep this, uh, also the contributions have to be really increased every year at, at, at this level. And we also put then uh, the, these benefits again back to the cost. We had this one billion uh, uh, personal cost uh, already in the previous slide. But if you also take into account um, both hardware cost and also the fact that the open source has to be you know, yeah, uh, generated over time and it's used over several periods, uh, we get a cost benefit ratio of one to four, which is similar to other cost benefit ratios um, regarding the investment in innovation or also hardware uh, from previous studies from the US. Therefore, that's a reasonable, uh, but still lower bound cost benefit ratio. Now I hand over to my colleagues, Mirko Böhm and Andrew Katz, uh, who performed the case studies. Excellent, uh, Knut, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, so uh, the study also involved uh, a number of case studies that we did. Uh, part of the rationale for this is the fact that open source hardware being something that is not um, <clears throat> as well developed as open source software in many ways, um, that it was um, not possible to do the same sort of quantitative analysis. So the case studies um, were very much more um, a qualitative analysis. And as well as open source soft um, hardware, we use the same method methodologies um, to look at a number of um, open source software projects as well. So we had a large candidate list and ultimately we selected 14 projects um, for, uh, for, for, for review and uh, we undertook a number of interviews as well. And we wanted to try to reach a fairly broad range and along a number of axes. So we wanted diversity of geography, uh, we wanted diversity of the sort of segments that these particular projects were operating in. Um, something that will become clear is that uh, we wanted diversity of openness as well. So not all of the projects that we studied would be regarded as being um, fully open. And um, we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, obviously, we're looking at some open source hardware and some um, open source software projects in there. And we also had diversity of business model and governance structure as well. And then we distilled those um, uh, uh, all of those case studies into 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 five um, specific studies that covered different sectoral success stories and areas. So let's just um, look at those individually. So the first one that we looked at, uh, we're calling make make it a manufacturer, and this is really where you have a situation where um, open source, whether um, uh, open source hardware, provides a bridge um, from one sector to another. 
Um, so for example, it could be academia, could be uh, research, could be citizen manufacturing, and then that facilitates activity within the industrial domain uh, that maybe wouldn't have been able to happen otherwise. And the projects that we looked at here at Arduino, which many people will be familiar with, um, so it's a family of uh, microcontroller boards, um, the CERN White Rabbit project, um, which um, clearly um, it, it, it arose uh, from particle physics, it's um, a mechanism for doing um, ultra precise timing and synchronization using the um, Ethernet um, networking protocol built on top of that and there's hardware around that as well. Uh, Myriad RF is a software defined radio project and um, RepRap as many of you will be familiar with um, is um, a, uh, an additive uh, manufacturing uh, product. So we chose Arduino as a su success story. Um, it really started off as part of the hobbyist maker manufacturer movement, uh, but then became a successful business in its own right with many direct um, industrial applications. And um, uh, during the course of this analysis, we uh, determined that the EU already possesses you know, enviable projects that really do lead the way in open source hardware. Um, but there is a degree of um, uh, uh, inhibition in the fact that the regulatory um, regime um, is 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 unclear in in some places, um, and um, the lack of clarity in IP can be an inhibitor. And um, we'll talk a little bit about um, you know possible ways of dealing with this, particularly in terms of patents later. Um, it's difficult to do manufacturing um, in Europe, um, especially when you're uh, competing um, with countries like China, for example. Um, you know, it may be that. Um, the, uh, the 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 um, European social structure um, um, it, you know adds costs to manufacturing etc. So we need to be quite careful about about how we how we deal with that. Um, then we looked at open hardware computing um, and infrastructure, and this very much shows how open source hardware really shifts innovation up the value chain. And by that we mean that um, an open source and this applies to software as well. And open source infrastructure um, really means that um, innovation can, can happen, uh, not at the very base level, at the infrastructure level, but, but really the differentiation can happen further up the value chain um, in terms of the applications that are um, uh, that, that, that the infrastructure is being used in. Um, so for this, we looked at the Open Compute Project, Risk V, and Sci Five, um, and this is really where my comment about openness comes in. Um, open Compute Project is um, on a spectrum of openness. You know, is open in many ways, but you could also argue that it's not fully open in some other ways. Um, Risk V, as an instruction set architecture. Um, is fully open, but Sci-5 is very much a, um, a commercial proprietary organization that provides proprietary solutions based on the RISC-V technologies, uh, but also is involved heavily in open source hardware as well. So from that perspective, um, it's, it's a hybrid. So when we analyze the success story, we looked at RISC-V and Sci-5 together and the, the interaction between them. Um, and RISC-V really, the instruction set architecture, it's, um, it emerges from, from academia um, that, uh, that work that was done um, at Berkeley in the US. Um, but um, it also has access to capital markets because of the fact that um, you know, it's, it's based in the Bay Area makes it um, easier to access those markets. Um, and from a government's perspective, um, Risk V Foundation um, is, is, um, has, has governance based in Switzerland as well. Um, but during the course of this analysis, I mean, we found that you know, there are a number of centers um, of excellence um, in the um, EU and EU adjacent regions, um, so Bologna, Barcelona and Zurich being three of them. Um, and there are many small and medium sized enterprises um, that are very knowledge intensive and active in this area as well. So there's a, there's a big community, there's a very, very powerful community which is um, active throughout Europe. Um, but we found that the biggest funding opportunities have still remain in the US. Uh, case three um, regards end user applications. Um, and this is really where we're talking about consumer focused applications. Um, and uh, it, 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 this is this is it's a complicated business environment here um, because we've we've got this the conflict between um, software freedom and business differentiation. In order to build a business, you need to be able to differentiate. Um, and uh, so the the question is, um, you know, where where does that differentiation sit? If it's unable to sit actually within the software itself because that's available um, on an open source basis, where does the differentiation sit? So um, we looked at CentOS, LibreOffice, NextCloud. Um, an OW2 as uh, the, uh, the, the 
uh, the, the, the projects and organizations. Um, and from those, we chose Nextcloud um, as the success story. So Nextcloud, um, it's um, a European business that um, uh, produces um, a, a, a system which um, enables you to uh, load basically cloud-based infrastructure um, onto your local server, um, and it competes with things like Microsoft Teams and uh, and um, Google G Suite and, and and so on and so forth. But um, it's all uh, capable of uh, being run um, on a local server, and um, it's um, it's therefore something that remains completely uh, within control of the user. All of it is available um, on free and open source software basis. So. Um, the key findings that um, in this, uh, this this particular case study um, were that um, you know we 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 uh, we were very interested in looking at the relationship between the altruistic and the business concerns. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, altruism behind the concept of free software, but how does that um, inter interrelate with the business concerns of being able to run a successful business uh, like Nextcloud? Uh, we found that the market was very much characterised by SMEs. Um, which tended to grow organically. So uh, there, the, there was little external investment involved there. Um, and we also found a, a scale disconnect between the application vendors um, and the service providers and, and integrators um, in, in this sector as well. Case four is embedded systems and internet of things. And by this, we're really talking about um, physical devices, typically um, you know, physically pretty small that contain general purpose computers, um, and uh, they have connectivity into the internet. They could do all sorts of things. We're very familiar with them from smartphones um, through to, uh, to fridges, lawnmowers. I mean, even cars uh, can be described as, um, as, as being embedded devices as well. Um, so once more, uh, we looked at CentOS as well and the Open Compute Project, Sci-5, um, and, and, and also uh, Yocto. And we chose Yocto as a success story. So Yocto um, is a framework that um, uh, it, it is a development environment that enables you to build a custom Linux distribution, um, which you can then embed into your uh, devices. So it, it's almost exclusively used in embedded systems. Um, and um, the findings here were that we've, there's a massive impact um, in the embedded systems IoT subsector, there's an awful lot going on in this um, this this sector. Um, huge amount of activity at the moment, um, and the inventive activity tends to be shifting towards software and and hardware um, combinations. Um, so you know this this. Um, I, just little devices that can sort of fit inside cars and monitor various things, um, devices that can be used as uh, part of networking infrastructure and so on. You know, people keep on coming up with new and interesting innovative devices using this, 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 this sort of um, technology. And there's a major European footprint in, in this area. Um, Europe is, is, is very active and, and has, a, has a lot of interesting projects emerging. Um, but it doesn't yet fully translate into market leading positions for companies within Europe. So Mirko, can I ask you to talk about case five, please? Sure, thank you, Andrew. So the public sector represents, in a way, a special case in this overall environment, as it complements private enterprise. And it has a, also a special relationship to open source software and hardware technologies that are also a public good. Um, and that means the public sector here interacts with the ecosystem in two ways. It is at the same time a consumer um, that procures from um, the, the businesses and the communities the technologies that are needed to run public services um, and also a contributor to the ecosystem and this is the part that is uh, in particular still emerging um, where what we see in the past contributions have been mostly indirect for example through the um, support of activities and, and the private enterprise and increasingly we see the public sector pick up um, own activities and starting to be yeah, like a original open source contributor um, from the start. We looked here at four specific projects specifically, OW2, Software Heritage, White Rabbit and XROAD. Um, Software Heritage in particular archives, um, source code artifacts, if you will, that are from the open source community for posterity and makes them part of our cultural heritage. Um, White Rabbit, we already spoke about, and XROAD is the data exchange layer that was initially developed in Estonia and Finland and is now becoming increasingly adopted all over the world 
um, as a system to exchange data between the public service agencies, even private enterprise, and um, with mechanisms in place to maintain authority over the data and control how it is shared. Um, and this especially, we highlight this also as a success story here, this indicates this role of a contributor to the open source ecosystem that the public sector is emerging into, um, where the, there's increasing cooperation on creating technologies um, in cooperation with private enterprise that are then operated um, by the public sector. Um, and where the, the public sector is able to A, define what technologies are being developed um, so that they serve government e-services needs, for example, um, and B, is able to collaborate with private enterprise for the operation um, of these services and for further contributions or customizations, um, which in a way really connects kind of the best of both worlds here, private enterprise and the public sector. Key findings in this area are that there is still a developing relationship um, between the open source software and hardware ecosystem and the public sector. The focus in the past was primarily on open source licensing as a mechanism to simplify licensing relationships um, and kind of basically to procure software that is necessary um, based on a free license. Um, and increasingly, we see collaboration becoming a more um, prominent part of this. Um, recently, this was also apparent in the development of the COVID-19 warning applications, where uh, they were initially mostly open source licensed, and then collaboration emerged between the countries that are using the same code base here. Um, and I think there's still a lot of potential here um, for an increasing and closer and closer relationship between the public sector and the wider open source ecosystem. Um, one thing that makes this um, a bit challenging is that the open source ecosystem is by definition international and doesn't really align itself to um, EU or national or member state borders, um, but it could also be this could also be a chance, not just a challenge. Um, with specific focus on the European economy, um, there is an enormous potential because of the, uh, the growth and the size of the single market to develop common e-service infrastructure for um, all sorts of exchange of data between the member states and within the European Union from um, transactions in trade to um, management of public services, uh, health systems, um, tax, etc. And if you consider that technologies like this, especially the code bases, technically only need to be developed once, the larger the market is that is able to collaborate on these aspects and to use them to, well, first of all, more efficiently, the development of these services will be, and um, the more powerful they will become. Um, there is there are a couple of challenges in this specific context. There's certainly a, a preference to local for local service providers that um, makes competition um, difficult sometimes. This is also already changing um, because the collaboration within the ecosystem is quite international already. And there is something we call here gratuitous uh, differentiation, basically where vendors are trying to um, kind of re regain control over the services that they are providing to the public sector by adding features to them that make them unique, but that aren't necessarily um, the core needs of the public service. But after that, you don't really have competition between the solutions anymore. This is something to primarily watch out for. And in this case, the public sector is the, the consumer of these services and, and can take uh, influence on the uh, the requirements essentially. Um, and overall, as I said, there's the, this emerging understanding of the public sector as a core contributor to the ecosystem. And I think this is a very welcome um, development. Okay, so um, the European Commission also asked us to conduct a, a public policy analysis, sort of looking at existing uh, government strategies around open source um, around the world. 
um, and uh, want to take time, some time here um, to, uh, to tell you about what OIFI did to better understand the government's relationship with open source. Um, so specifically, what did the Commission ask us to do here? Um, they wanted us to look at existing policies and, and sort of to create a framework uh, that would allow, um, allow for a comparison of different public policy actions across a number of countries, um, both to understand uh, what the governments had been doing and in what areas, and um, understanding sort of what had worked uh, well and uh, where there were lessons to be learned. And um, at the same time, I, I should emphasize here that uh, we were not asked to be sort of um, normative, but, uh, but more to sort of uh, create a framework that would allow for, for some comparisons. Um, and um, we also wanted to understand a little bit uh, better the different reasons for why governments uh, would like to engage with open source, um, to ask questions uh, with regards to how this involvement has evolved over time, uh, and also uh, to look at some of the factors that play a role um, in, 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 in uh, creating those preferences. And um, thirdly, uh, we wanted to get an idea of why certain policy actions worked well uh, and um, created uh, positive effects and why others uh, did not and what uh, sort of what was missing in those cases. Um, we also uh, conducted uh, additional analyses in uh, focusing on specific areas uh, that the commission was interested in. Uh, these included open hardware, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. Um, I unfortunately don't have time to go, go into those details today, but um, obviously I link that we link back to the study for that. So um, the significant effort was put into creating um, a framework, um, and we sort of um, I think here presenting in a quite a simple um, way. Um, we sort of uh, took the viewpoint that uh, public sector engagement with open source has two main dimensions. Um, first, we can see public policies that are aimed um, at the public sector. Um, and then sort of public sector uh, policies that are aimed to, um, to stimulate the economy and to engage with the private sector actors. Um, so if we look at the first dimension, uh, the public sector, uh, we looked at uh, elements such as uh, public procurement policies, um, internal and public strategies um, relating to, to competences, um, skills, etc. Um, and then, you know, with regards to the second dimension, uh, we looked at how the government uh, governments had, had involved with private sector actors and, and looked at more sort of the innovative um, aspects of open source and contributions to, um, to, to growth, um, entrepreneurship, um, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, for this, uh, this part of the study, uh, we relied on, 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 on desk research and also conducted over 50 expert interviews in, uh, active in the countries that we, that we studied. So just to have a quick look at the, the countries that we looked at um, in the study. Um, so we covered um, and agreed these countries in, 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 um, in conversation with the, the European Commission uh, and covered countries both in the European member states and the United Kingdom and um, also in, in both North, North America and South America. And, as well as a, uh, a few countries in, in, in Asia. We also wanted to look a little bit more closely at sort of um, uh, what motivates uh, these um, governments uh, in, 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 you know, across, uh, across the world to engage with open source. And we identified uh, four main sort of um, uh, areas, um, economic concerns, um, political concerns, technical concerns, and, and legal concerns. And, um, and so we also mapped uh, the countries in, in terms of uh, these issues. And we could see that also um, 
there are some patterns emerging there where um, if I just go to the next slide, we can see that um, there were sort of, we've seen sort of so far two uh, main waves uh, of uh, government policies around open source. Um, and where the first one, I think, was um, a lot driven around, uh, you know, first maybe sparked by, by activism, uh, also um, interest from the government side was mainly focused on on um, on uh, on cost cost reductions, um, and uh, we have sort of um, a second wave of interest um, where it's more based on uh, it's more driven by sort of the private sector uptake of open source, um, and then you know we are seeing also. Um, I'm, 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 we're, you know, we're thinking now there is a sort of, uh, we'll call it maybe a third wave, but uh, increased awareness of, of, in Europe at least, uh, of the digital sovereignty aspects, uh, which is also important to the Commission. And so some of the, you know, takeaways from this is that um, indeed um, it's important, uh, as was illustrated in Italy, that, you know, that um, the focus cannot only be on on, on, on policy and legislation. Um, awareness is very important. Um, and also understanding what um, uh, motivation um, to engage with open source um, within the institutions. Um, and that the success of any policy really depends a lot on, on culture uh, and being able to sort of follow up policy with, uh, with um, with awareness and in a, in a change in, in, in culture. Um, I, um, another issue is um, political support where we've seen in a lot of cases that, um, that when there is support at the political level, when the issue becomes uh, politically, politically salient, this can come to the top of the agenda, but um, there needs to be some sort of institutional change, cultural change has to happen um because these sort of um moments they come they come and go and um and then can often lead to something at quite big statements uh, uh ambitious policies that are not uh you know where the results are not realized and um so um you know again i think um just continuing on this uh um, lessons learned is that um, that culture is really key, and I'm going to you know quickly um, you know when we move to the policy recommendations, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, uh, political support um, at, from the top um, can be very valuable, but it needs to um, trickle down. Need to have institutional change. Um, and also um, a sort of uh, awareness raising. Um, uh, so, you know, it's not uh, top down, bottom up. Um, it's not an either or. I think we need, we need to have some, some level of both. Okay, so moving on to sort of the final uh, part of, uh, of um, this panel is really um, taking everything together. I think notes. Um, part on, on, on the sort of the, the economic impact and the findings there about um, just sort of being able to quantify um, the, the value of open source to, to the European economy um, and um, the, the sort of insights uh, from the case studies uh, about um, sort of the opportunities and challenges and then also sort of lessons learned from, from existing policies. Uh, the commission also had asked us to um, to uh, to come up with uh, a list of uh, policy recommendations. And um, I'm just going to um, talk about uh, the first part. Um, we have uh, sort of, uh, I think we came up with a list of 30 or so recommendations. We also then uh, try to look at uh, both sort of um, uh, in a way, um, looking almost at the, the possibilities of the European Commission to ask both, uh, act both as a sort of, uh, you know, the initiator of, uh, of public policies, but also 
as a funder of research, and uh, and finally um, as sort of uh, being able to act as a as a catalyst um, in 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 building uh, and driving an internationally competitive European industry. So um, I think really if we look at um, sort of the first aspect, which is a dig digitally autonomous public sector. Um, we uh, have really focused on this aspect of being able to uh, have the institutional capacity to engage with these issues. Um, I think Knut at the beginning mentioned something about sort of the size of the open source um, software sector in Europe and, and comparing it to some other sectors where if you look at, um, at uh, you know, at European governments and the European Commission, uh, those sectors um, are um, the focus of quite uh, sort of uh, large departments, in, uh, government departments. Um, we don't see that level of sort of institutional capacity in, in, in Europe today. And so we're making this sort of um, basic comment that the value of open source uh, to the European economy exceeds the institutional uh, capacity in Europe uh, that would be needed to extract that value and to sort of to to um, to uh, you know to encourage further uh, investment in open source. So really, that's what I, we are emphasizing first and uh, foremost is is building this capacity. And then the European Commission has already taken a step uh, last year to to build uh, an open source program program office in OSPO, and this is something we see as very um, a very crucial step. And we, I think, are um, asking, you know, or recommending that the Commission um, promote such a network of OSPOs um, within the member states in Europe. And also that um, the Commission has the opportunity to, um, to sort of um, uh, be a co coordinator, if you will, of this, uh, of this, um, of this uh, network. Um, and, um, you know, it's sort of, um, yeah, uh, in a semi-formal way, but it will still uh, enable this sort of um, collaboration and uh, uh, cooperation. Um, I will hand over to um, to Knut uh, for um, our next set of uh, policy recommendations. Thank you, Sashiko, for um, focusing it into the, the first pillar of this um, uh, yeah table of policy recommendations, especially on building institutional capacity. Overall, this, this also then contributes to uh, and, and create uh, an increased legitimacy of, of open source. Another point from a researcher's perspective I just want to make is uh, we also need better data. That means um, uh, open source activities um, that may, may even impact should be really going into the, the portfolio of, of the data collection activities by Eurostat at the, at the European level in order to, to increase and improve the, the evidence base, which we have called for at the very beginning of our talk. Uh, that's, that's also a very uh, important uh, recommendation from my side. Now, uh, looking at um, another list of, of policy recommendations, which are a little bit derived from the, the concept of innovation systems and the different functions. And uh, first, um, we have to invest more in uh, the development of open source. That means r and funding programs should focusing especially on, on open source soft, but also is partly hardware uh, activities, also uh, maybe specific programs for open source based companies and organizations uh, can be recommended. That's, that's, that's one aspect. And um, in order to generate the, the economic benefit uh, of open source, it has also to be distributed. And in the context of digital sovereignty, maybe setting up um, a European uh, repository uh, is a, another proposal um, which, which might be considered. And also in, in improve the networks, also the, the, the networks between the private and the public sector uh, which are related and focus on, on, on open source. A third and very important aspect, because I, I didn't focus on this result, uh, we also found that the increase of 10% uh, more contributions per year into open source would also create around 600 additional uh, open source based startups. 
That means here, uh, open source is an important source for pushing also the creation of new companies. But this is, uh, has been neglected, neglected in all the startup programs so far. That means here again, um, specific programs, which especially focusing on, on creating startups uh, in the open source context, also by providing uh, guidance for uh, the, the, the people in doing so. That means especially also kind of giving them skills and knowledge to, uh, to develop sustainable business models around open source is an important aspect. A fourth point, and this is especially for Europe, a crucial uh, general trend. We have a demographic trend, which uh, will reduce the, uh, the skilled people in, in general. And we have already a, a skills shortage related uh, to contributors to open source. This has already been shown in the, in the Bitcom uh, open source monitor as a most uh, relevant disadvantage for companies to get involved. That means here, um, also universities, and I'm also here representing the TU Berlin as one big techno universities, they have to really expand their activities here. And uh, thanks to Mirko giving a course also on open source uh, in our chair. Uh, this, but this is only a very small uh, activity uh, compared to, to uh, the, the kind of really broad initiative to, to strengthen the human capital uh, uh, development related to open source uh, skills. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also important. Now, if we move from these kind of uh, research and human capital uh, focused um, uh, set of recommendations to, to the more industry related one, also access to, uh, to financial uh, capital um, is an issue. And uh, one uh, important instrument, which is beyond this, is, is also the role of public procurement. That means here, uh, if the public sector really uh, steers their, their, their public procurement um, activities by, by opening up or maybe by even encouraging um, open source based, especially small companies to, uh, to really submit tenders uh, and offers to provide their solutions to the public sector, would be great, maybe a, a, a double dividend, yeah, both for the public sector, but also for the companies which uh, which are really then uh, maybe winning uh, these bids uh, and, and providing additional uh, open source. Then the regulatory environment is also not yet really um, yeah, open or, or taking the open source issues into account. Yeah, we see no reference in the intellectual property regulations uh, at the EU, EU level, which make explicit links to, uh, to, to open source. That's, that, that's, that's an issue. Also the public procurement regulations, they, they address the important role of international standards or standards in general, but no mentioning of open source as another uh, important element for public procurement. Yeah. And uh, market creation is, is also an important aspect here uh, that, uh, that the, the competition uh, rules um, and, and competition regulations take open source into account, especially since we have seen that, that platform companies are really relying heavily on open source uh, and, and building their business model on that. And, and here, this has to be considered. And so far, uh, the, the competition regulations and the the, the, the implementation of the, these regulations and practice uh, do not yet consider uh, the important uh, role of open source as maybe an instrument to lower the barriers to entry to new markets, but might be also misused by, by some play, big players according to their interests, which is then harming their own market. That means here uh, that, that that's uh, also an uh, important aspect to be considered. Now I hand over to our open source hardware specialist, Andrew, for the, the next two uh, issues uh, on our list. Thank you, Knut. Uh, and those recommendations are equally as applicable in almost all cases uh, to open source hardware as they are to open source software. Um, but we also considered, and you can look at the report in greater detail for these, we also considered a number of uh, specific recommendations for policy as they apply specifically to open source hardware. So one of the things that we identified uh, was a 
lack of harmonization of patent rules throughout the member states. Um, so what we um, suggest is that it would be helpful to introduce a standardized safe harbor so that people who were working in the area of open hardware were aware that when they were using uh, uh, doing work that was, um, for example, research, or they were um, uh, doing uh, activities in, in, in a domestic context, um, that uh, they would automatically not be infringing any patents. So we have to sort of balance the rights of the researchers, um, the developers, and people um, using open hardware in a domestic context um, with the rights of the patent holders. So that's something we want to, to look into as well. Um, we also um, recommend that um, research is done on looking at the regulatory regime. There is always a tension between uh, clearly everyone um, agrees that consumers need to be kept safe and in order for consumers to be safe in areas um, such as medical devices, pharmaceutical, automotive and so on and so forth. Uh, we need to have rules that make sure that um, the, the, the devices, um, et cetera, um, when they're delivered to the consumer are safe. Uh, but the problem is that there's a tension there between that and the federated manufacturing and the self-manufacturing that can um, happen in the context of open source hardware. So we need to look at regulatory mechanism, me mechanisms that both protect the uh, safety and security of the consumer while at the same time allowing the development of open source hardware infrastructure to take place and open source hardware manufacturing to happen in a way that's not inhibited by um, overburdensome regulation for when the various uh, materials are manufactured, put onto the market and acquired by consumers as well. Um, another issue uh, relates to the tools and services. Now, um, for open hardware, uh, if we're talking about software tools, for example, so the sort of tools that you might need um, as part of a hardware description language tool chain. Um, at the moment, although there's um, an increasing number of open source tools available, um, still many of the major tool chains and the tools that are needed for um, uh, testing and simulating designs and so on are still in the proprietary world. Um, so thought needs to be given um, to how the situation can be move into one that's much more similar to the open source software world where um, many of the tool chains are themselves open source. Um, but that also ties into the fact that obviously with hardware quite often you need physical machines to be able to create open hardware design. So for example things like um, you know lathes, milling machines, uh, 3D printers and so on and so forth. So uh, one way of um, making these more accessible to people to uh, enable the communities to access them um, is through the support of fab labs and maker spaces and similar centers of, of excellence where many people can make use of, of this equipment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, last point here on our list is sustainability and indeed uh, here I think we are at the very beginning. Um, of exploiting uh, the, the options of open source soft and but also hardware to approach uh, maybe uh, more in detail the, the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And here also uh, policy has to consider uh, the potential of open source in order to address these uh, future uh, major challenges. So, and this moves us to uh, the summary slide. Um, uh, we have seen or we have revealed that there's a large economic impact uh, for open source software and uh, maybe this impact could be uh, similar for open source hardware in the future. Uh, public policy uh, is an important instrument to, to push that because we have here also some uh, market or system failure. Uh, which can be addressed by, by public uh, policy. On the other hand, what we have just seen, there are very different areas of policy which have to be taken on board and, and we have to find kind of a, a coordinated policy mix approaching all these different uh, steps uh, from really providing the, the framework conditions in the public sector to uh, the R&D, the entrepreneurship and the market creation uh, including then the regulatory framework, which have to be addressed. And uh, we have also the challenge that we have different layers. We have the European Commission layer, we have the national uh, um, uh, member states layer, but, but open source, especially if we think about procurement, this goes down to the municipalities and the regional level. And this is another challenge which has to be addressed. And therefore, still 
quite some work to do, but uh, based on our finding, it's, it's worthwhile, not only from an economic perspective, but also from a social and at the end, from a sustainability perspective. Thank you very much.